happy to see all your faces. We are excited to be joined by four artists today, our former residents. And um, as usual, I want to remind you that we are creating these weekly programmings um, as a way to stay together and stay connected as a community. If you feel like becoming a member, if you aren't one already, which I, I look around and I have a feeling most of you are members, but just in case you need to renew, go check that out and feel free to also think about making a donation if you enjoy this program and um, want to support it. We are recording today, so um, just be aware of that. And um, the recording will be available on our YouTube channel in a bit. I'd like to acknowledge that I am sitting and the Clay Studio stands on um, traditionally Lenny Lenape land here in um, the Eastern seaboard of our country. We are um, grateful to the communities that have come before us in many different ways. We are moving towards the future, as Amy said, and as the title of the show implies, um, in hopefully September, definitely the fall of next year, we will be in our new building. And we are working to really engage the resident alumni, of which there are many, to continue to energize the Clay Studio itself, but also just the networks that that exist um, all over the world, as we can see from our um, international guests today. We'll get to that in a minute. So if any of you are former residents and would like to be involved in committees or, um, you know, reaching out to other residents and other people around the, the country and the world to talk about how great the Clay Studio is, we would appreciate that. We are um, going to get started with our introductions in a moment. And then we can um, show you some images from this exhibition that opens on Saturday and it has 50 works of art from um, current and former residents of the Clay Studio. So in alphabetical order, we are gonna introduce our guests. Um, Kelsey Chase Folsom received his MFA in ceramics from the University of Colorado. Boulder and his BFA from Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia. He's been a resident artist at numerous places, including the Center for Ceramics in Berlin, the Hambage Center um, in Georgia, and here the Clay Studio in Philadelphia. He's taught at Maryland Institute of Co um, College of Art, New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred, the George Washington University, Corcoran College of Art and Design, University of the Arts here in Philly, Virginia Commonwealth University, and currently he's an adjunct faculty at SUNY New Paltz. He currently lives and works in Kingston, New York. Um, our next guest, hi Chase, is Joanna Pike. She was born in Portland, Maine and earned her BFA in ceramics from Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. After completing her degree, she traveled to Medicine Hat in um, Alberta to attend Medalta as a full year resident. Other residencies of hers have included the Archie Bray Foundation and the Clay Studio. Her work has been exhibited in venues such as Taquicon Art Fair, New York Design Week, Powabic Pottery, the shop at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Delaware Art Museum, and District Clay Gallery. She earned her, um, she currently, sorry, is um, earning her MFA in studio art at the University of Arkansas Fayetteville. Paulina Polanin, who's joining us all the way from um, Nor from Bergen. Thank you for joining us at a much different time of the day. Was born and raised in Finland and earned her BA in ceramics and glass design from Kuopo Design Academy in Finland. I probably said that wrong, sorry, Paulina. Um, and her MA in from the Oslo National Academy of Arts in Norway in 2012. She was a resident here at the Clay Studio from 2014 to 17, and then she was invited to have a prestigious Finnish Institute in London ceramics residency um, at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, where I was excited to get to visit her. She snuck me in the V&A at 8.30 in the morning. It was very exciting. She was then invited by the Helsinki Design Museum. Um, she had her first solo show there in Finland, and her first solo show in Finland, not her first solo show. Um, and she currently is a PhD fellow at the University of Bergen. Matt Wilt, who is last as am I always, um, 
but that's okay. Easy to find us on a list. Matt earned his BA in ceramics and art education from Penn State and his master of fine arts from Ohio University at Athens. His work is mixed media and integrates cast ceramic forms with wheel thrown and hand built elements. Matt has been the recipient of numerous grants and awards. He received two Pennsylvania Council of the Arts grants, an Illinois Art Council Fellowship, and the Evelyn Shapiro Foundation Fellowship here at the Clay Studio. His artwork can be found in the collection of the Crocker Museum of Art in Sacramento, the De Young Museum in San Francisco, Arizona State University's Ceramic Research Center, the Hand Art Center of Stetson University, Kennedy Museum of American Art, and others. He's been uh, an invited lecturer and a visiting artist at universities and schools across the US. And um, I'm realizing that your bio doesn't say your current position, Matt, <laughs> which is? Um, I, I currently teach at Skidmore College in upstate New York in Saratoga Springs, New York. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna talk about your time at the Clay Studio. So we'll go back to Chase and ask, um, what do you think was your most um, transformative concept? Was it an experience? Was it um, a realization that happened during your residency time at the Clay Studio? Um, well, I think that um, the, the Clay Studio, especially when you're moving uh, across the country or um, for, you know, a few of us uh, or a few people, um, you're moving across the world um, and you're making that transition to the, the city of Philadelphia. And um, it was like an instant direct plug into the art community there. Um, but the thing that I loved about it is I could go to an opening uh, anywhere in the city, obviously meet new artists, but it also connected me to um, uh, different kinds of makers. And I would say um, a lot of my work, I, I am um, an interdisciplinary artist. I work in ceramics, but, um, but it really allowed me to, to, to flex that like interdisciplinarity that is in my work. And I was working with um, grad students in glass at Tyler, um, you know, them helping me make some work. Um, and then also with a, um, a foundry, independent foundry uh, in North Philly. Um, so it really, it was so lovely to finish grad school and then get that residency, but also just the Clay Studio, the residents were incredible. I, you know, I'm still friends with all of them. Um, I still talk to them. And, um, and I actually was just there and I stayed overnight with one of them, <laughs> um, you know, and so it was, it was such an incredible time where I could, I felt like I could flex um, all the interdisciplinarity that I, that I am, but it was just so convenient, you know, um, and people were so generous. And I think that that was, um, I still think that's the best work I've, I've made in 10 years. Um, I still look at that work. Um, and that work is still informing my practice. Um, I can talk about that later, but yeah. Yeah, so it was that it, you, you felt like you were supported and you had access. Yeah, I had access. Yeah. I think that like, you know, um, it was really difficult. You know, I was, you know, I had a part-time job but I have full-time bills. So it doesn't, you know, that's like always a problem. Um, but I, you know, you figure it out. And I think that like, there was just so much support from the residents um, and the artists in the area and, and you know, and the Clay Studio um, that it made it, I don't know. I, I have really fond memories. It was hard, but I think that like, it also made me desperate in a way that was a good thing. Cause I think desperation drives practice. Um, so, you know. Or necessity is the mother of invention. But yeah, desperation is a more dramatic way to say that. <laughs> and you or were- Necessity is a real mother. <laughs> um, 2013 to seven, no, 2013 to 15? I can't 15. remember. Yeah, yeah. Um, excellent. And feel free everyone to say like what was problematic as well, although it's nice to focus on the good things. We we. We are in a moment of transition, which is so exciting in, in a lot of ways. And it means that we can really kind of take a step back and say, okay, we love these things about the program and we want to amp up the, the positives. So how do we pro provide more support, 
maybe financially at the same time still providing this idea that I, I like the idea that it is a bit um, of a sort of sheltered first step into the just general world where you're going to have to pay all your own bills um, and not have that professional um, support around you. But letting people have that focus time while like taking steps into the rent paying world, I guess. I also want to. I also want to add to that too, because I, you know, I, I do say I've said this when I left, and and I will say it again. But like when I have enough money, I want to support a resident. I want to have one of those fellowships. Like that's a goal of mine in my practice, um, because I don't have that. I'm not even close to that. I just bought a house, which had, took all my money, but. You know, I think that like that. I think I think that that's so important. I wish, you know, the fellowship that's offered. I wish we could have that for every single resident. Um, it, you know, I think rent right now. I think it's still two fifty. I don't know if it's still that. But I, you know, I will say when when I was there, we I think we had lost the Wingate and um, for that, and it was like it was like two hundred fifty bucks, which doesn't seem like a lot. It is. It's a lot. Um, and so I think that like, I think that, that I would, if I could, um, or not if I could, when I can, I want to do that. Like, I think that would be tremendous. Um, yeah. Well, and there's a way to, that's a great thing to say. And I, I think there's a, there's a way to, to build up to that as well. And it doesn't have to be one person, one fellowship, you know, there's a, there's a group, a group effort. I think Jen just put something in the chat, which maybe we'll get back to when we go towards fundraising at the end. But uh, how about Joanna? Do you want to talk about something that was um, valuable in terms of your evolution as an artist while you were at the Clay Studio? Yeah, I think um, I was actually there for the full five years from 2013 to 2018, I believe. That feels so long ago right now. <laughs> um, and I, I do want to echo what you said about, or what both you and Chase have said about uh, having a community that was really supportive. Um, I was relatively young when I came in and I felt like I needed to surround myself with people who took their career very seriously and who wanted to be there almost as a mentor for people who were incoming. Um, so I definitely felt like I received su support, not only from the Clay Studio, um, uh, employees but you know from the the other artists in the residency which meant so much to me um and i think because uh we did not have a lot of funding at that time and while the rent was subsidized it was still something that felt like you really needed to be working your your side job pretty hard um it allowed me a very different residency experience than I had previously had at the other ones where it was very much this hyper intensive experience and you know you lived in the studio whereas at the clay studio it's more about finding a live work balance and I think that gave me some distance from my work in a way that I really hadn't gotten up until that point and it allowed me to take stock in a sense of what really my values were in terms of producing my work and what it was that the work really needed to be um, and understanding that what I came in with in terms of what my work was doing by the time I left it was nice to see how much that had changed and even though the work felt pretty similar in terms of the aesthetic and what the project really was it was something where with the time that I had had um, it really changed into something entirely different that made me feel like I had the confidence to go into doing an MFA and to know that I could stand my ground on what it was I knew was important to me. So I definitely have the Clay Studio to thank for that. And I think having the experience be what it was, um, I wouldn't have changed it. That got me to where I am now. So yeah, yeah. I do want to thank the Clay Studio for five great years. Well, and we we were so happy that you were with us. Um, it's it's that mix of people who have who are working towards figuring it out together. I think that makes it um, really valuable. Like every time I in the olden times when I could bring people on tours of the fourth floor, you know, talking about how each artist was kind of making a living was such an important part of telling the story of the program, and that everybody had not, on, not only how many different things you can do with clay, because everybody's work, you 
you know, everyone's working in ceramics generally and everyone's work looks so different. And then everyone's kind of making it work in a different way. And, and the visitors who are often most interested in like, well, you know, what do they do every day? How do they make this happen? And to tell 12 different stories means that there are all these different ways that you can do it. And that seeing that and being surrounded by all those things, I, I hope is valuable. It sounds like it was, so that's great. How about you, Paulina? Do you have a, a thought about your, um, your evolution while you were there or a, a particular thing that helped or changed your practice? Um, I came November, 2014 and stayed until 2016. And of course it was uh, very, very exciting to live <laughs> for a period in the United States coming from um, uh, Nordic countries, uh, very small population, small language groups, and um, yeah, and I guess uh, as a whole, the ceramic scene is maybe a little bit different here than it what it is in US. So it was interesting to look at where I was coming from, from, but also like reflect, um, or yeah, or like look at how how like the differences between from where I was coming from and, um, but also obviously similarities. Um, yeah, and I guess I had done some residences before, but all of them were in small, you know, kind of rural, small town, a little bit secluded. And here it was uh, middle of the old town and a lot of people. And I guess there was the first time I've been in a place where there's uh, that's, type of sense of uh, like a tight-knit community. Um, <laughs> obviously, based on this sort of um, funding structures, what we have, um, if Claywood Studio would exist in uh, Finland, it would get some government funding for sure. <laughs> and uh, But uh, I guess for us, as uh, Chase was talking about necessity, um, yeah, but from there, it's just all this sort of, um, and I did a little bit of Claymobile, the, um, the reach out program, which was really like an uh, eye opener for me also uh, to see how the, the school system and everything and um, yeah, and how like badly funded uh, the education is. And it's, uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's not maybe uh, concentrate on the negative things in that sense, but, um, and I guess, um, and because of, uh, well, funding makes all the type of things possible. And um, the only reason I was I could uh, apply for the residency was because I got a working grant from uh, Norwegian government, right. which is kind of like the sort of minimum income thing. And because of the visa thing, you cannot really work. And uh, except then, and this was again, um, first uh, step for me to teach. I did a little bit of, I had a, I did a yeah the Claymobile and then occasionally doing date nights and <laughs> I, I think I had a hand building course at some point as well and uh, that also really um, yeah that have actually like I've taken my first steps in teaching in uh, at the clay studio yeah and I often think that when you go make a big move like that you you appreciate or just a notice the things in your own place your own country and culture that you might not really even have thought about until you went to the U.S. and you were like oh it's so different here and whether they were good differences or bad differences when you go back um I think For you sure. can appreciate some things more than you might otherwise have and you know see where changes could be made hmm. Yeah, but also like, um, yeah, obviously you need a distance enabled to re reflect. Um, but one thing I'm absolutely like the maybe most grateful is the the, the friends and colleagues I got to know during this uh, almost two years. Um, it's been, it was really, it's it was really fantastic. That's nice to hear. Yeah, yeah, it's the networks, right? It's the people and the connections that are um, some of the most valuable things and that we can continue that and, and continue those connections as we move forward, I think is really exciting. Um, so how about you, Matt? You were here at a different 
I feel a little bit, um, <clears throat> I know you're like, a, a bit of a chunk were before the other three that we have. So I don't know how different the experience was also because I wasn't here at that time. Yeah, kind of the token old guy. But the um, I, I've been enjoying listening to what people had to say about their experiences. And I think there was a lot of similarities. And I'm real curious too, Amy and Ruth are here uh, to know some of their memories of the evolution or the, you know, the kind of development, because they have a much, I think, you know, kind of longer perspective on it than, than some of us do. But I was there for four years in the late 90s, uh, came in with the Shapiro Fellowship, which was absolutely pivotal. I mean, it was such, a, uh, and just heard recently of Stan Shapiro's passing away, and uh, so sad to hear about that. But I can't even really describe adequately, you know, the significance of the Shapiro Fellowship of the Clay Studio. I grew up in rural Pennsylvania, and when I was a student at Penn State in the late 80s, early 90s, I would travel to Philly and go to the Clay Studio, and it was almost like a, like a mecca of a, of a certain sense, because I was aware from reading magazines like Ceramics Monthly what exhibitions were going to be there, and I would get down there from time to time. And when you grow up in a you know small town Pennsylvania, going to Philly is like such a like a mind blowing experience. And seeing a lot of that work in person at the galleries at Snyderman Works and at the Clay Studio, those things were really really pivotal even before I was a resident there. Uh, and I didn't get down as often as I wanted. The Clay Studio used to run a lecture series up at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and we as students at Penn State would come down. I, I met June Canico there when I was like a sophomore in college and, you know, spoke to him after his lecture briefly. And so there was, there was just all kinds of uh, nostalgic memories I have about Philadelphia and about the Clay Studio and how it's grown over the years. But one of the major things for me personally was I, I left graduate school and got the Shapiro Fellowship. I probably applied to about 20 different opportunities, both teaching jobs and residency positions. And my memory is, is that I got the Shapiro Fellowship and I got a residency at Aeromont in Tennessee and I chose Philadelphia and, and the Clay Studio. Um, and it was an opportunity for me to continue the habits that I had developed in graduate school, which was to, you know, work um, extensively in the studio and have that um, autonomy and freedom to really um, evolve and push my work and develop my work. And it was, um, it was a chance to continue that evolution outside of the graduate program that I was in. And um, had I not had something like that available, I just feel like it would have been a real struggle to, to just build on that momentum and to continue that momentum. And so the Clay Studio, I had a longstanding history with as a outsider who had gone there to see lectures and exhibitions and was kind of in awe of the place and then had the great fortune to go there as a member, as a, as a resident artist and as the, the fellowship recipient that first year and be um, and get to participate in that history a little bit. And so um, just to echo what some of the other folks have said too, the people that I met there, um, the, the staff and the students and the fellow residents and the associates, just some great long-standing friendships, a gr great support network. And I was also just blown away by the vibrancy of the art and the craft community specifically in Old City, Philadelphia. Uh, leaving a place like Athens, Ohio, where it's a very kind of uh, insulated, isolated part of Ohio. And to go to a place like Philadelphia and meet collectors and see exhibitions, um, it was, in many ways, it was like an introduction to the professional world of being an artist and getting into, uh, you know, collections and selling work and seeing exhibitions. So it was pivotal in a number of ways. It was a way to continue evolving. It was a way to see how uh, professionals were working and exhibiting and selling their work. And um, I can't really... Uh, 
put it into words adequately, but it was um, a, a kind of a, a just just a, a great continuation of that evolution that I felt for me personally had begun in, in graduate study. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. And the, your point about Old City being this, um, you know, community where I, I, even though things have changed, you know, he, Ruth and Rick are here. I can see. I can even see Rick's head in the background there. <clears throat> but you know, we used to be able to walk around one block and go to the Snydermans on the, and then at, Matt, when you were there, this wasn't the case, but the Center for Art and Wood moved mm -hmm. down to, gosh, and I think that somebody told me that was seven years ago, which seems like it was only two years ago, but, um, and the Wexler Gallery and, you know, the, mm -hmm. how incredibly concentrated all of that was, and the Modern Gallery of Furniture, like, it, amazing, and it's changing, so that, can be kind of sad, but I'm, I'm hoping that because that group of galleries and people were together for so long in that little geographic location, even though that um, it's dispersing, it's gonna be, we've, we can continue in different ways to keep connected. Like we now we have an organization called Craft Now Philadelphia that kind of was intended to, to cement those, those um, relationships. So across as the geography changes, but yeah, so I'm hearing all of you say that it has a lot to do with relationships and support, why it was a, a valuable experience, which I feel very excited about to be able to be part of that. Um, having been here at the Clay Studio for six years now, can't believe that. Matt. I just wanted to throw in there too, because you talk about all of those galleries and that was a big part of my experience there even prior to becoming a resident. Uh, and that's one of the things that I have very mixed feelings about as well about the move is that um, I imagine that Amy must feel this way on some level and, and Ruth too, is that there is such a tie to that, at least in my mind, to that neighborhood and to that environment. And um, I well, know that this, the move is a great thing and a, a great opportunity, but I have such nostalgic kind of feelings for that time and place too, in the gallery scene and the first Fridays and the, uh, the enthusiasm and the energy. Um, just excited to see where that will, what it will evolve into also. Yeah, and I'm sure, I don't know if Amy wants to say anything, but we could certainly talk about the fact that it's, it's just not, it's not the same as it was. Um, so that that feeling that you have and that even my brain of like walking around the, the block, it isn't that. Modern Gallery is gone. The Snydermans very deservedly have retired and <laughs> sort of, uh, but don't have the gallery anymore. Um, uh, the old city, I've been involved with the community organization. They went from something like 40 galleries in a five block radius to like 17 galleries. It's just really, totally different and and where we are moving to is a new vibrant area with um other different galleries uh, right across from the crane building the uh, next fab which is a kind of tech-based art institution and and lots of lots of other organizations that are kind of moving up in that direction so it the you don't need to have mixed feelings because that that idea in your mind unfortunately or fortunately doesn't exist anymore so uh, it's going to it's change. Oh, who's I have one of your sculptures on my shelf in the living room. I'll never forget you and I love your work. And I, we still get a Christmas card and letter from Chris Staley every year. And we do keep in touch with so many of our artists and some of our clients, which gives us some satisfaction, even though we don't have the gallery anymore. And so um, we're glad we don't have the gallery right now. This would be the worst time to have the gallery. So we're just two blocks away and still enjoying life. And we love all of this. So I have to jump in here, not because I'm ignoring you, but because I'm working on a project because there's a Zoom meeting tonight uh, about saving the Painted Bright Art Center building. And I'm going to read you what I just finished writing. Oh, no, you can't read it. It's just, I'm going to be one, one paragraph. Oh, good. One paragraph. Okay. So, <laughs> density and variety are what define an urban area. Pain and Pride came to Old City 40 years ago. Old City was not a place you or any of the Ben Franklin uh, North neighbors would have considered wanting to live. But it was true that community arts organizations like the Bride, 
the Arden Theater, the Fringe, the Clay Studio, the Center for Art and Wood, which was originally a fifth in Vine, came over the next 40 years, along with lots of people, that made it possible for places like Radicchio, Cafe Ole, Sassafras Convenience Store, and many more places that are part of the fabric of a living community. When we came to Old City 35 years ago, there were no young couples pushing baby carriages. Now we see such residents every day in our streets. That's the future. And any community that doesn't think about that will not survive. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, good point. It's we the the organizations built that community the way it is now. That's for sure. Um, so I want to thank you, Rick, and I want to go back um, around our our roundtable here and talk a little bit about um, how everyone's artwork that's this in this exhibition specifically kind of how they feel it reflects whether specifically their time at the clay studio or just in general the way their work has evolved um so i guess we're not technically in alphabetical order anymore so joanna do you want to go first um this is actually related directly to the project i'm doing for my thesis that'll be in march um, this isn't actually included in that installation, but it is uh, very similar to some of the pieces that are in it. Uh, but I felt I wanted to send it to this show because it does relate pretty directly to some of the, the parts of what I took from my time at the Clay Studio. Um, I've always worked in smaller pieces that work, you know, all together to build this larger installation, um, which is something that I had been doing at the Clay Studio in different respects. Um, and is what I'm doing now for my thesis project. Um, but this also speaks a little bit to some fond uh, memories of clothing swaps that we used to do. Um, this one's called T-shirt gown with fuzzy pockets. Um, there are a variety of things that don't quite go together, sort of like what you would take home at the end of the night from a clothing swap. Um, things you'll add to your closet, but they don't really go together to make an outfit. Um, and I think that speaks to my time there in an important way because it does connect to the sense of community that I had um, both in the residency and sort of at large, not just in the clay studio, but in Philadelphia in general. I met a lot of great people going to those events and it, it was always something that, you know, I hope to carry with me outside of that. <laughs> I haven't been able to do one since then, um, partly because of uh, COVID, of course, but um, I think this piece in particular, more than anything I've made probably since I got to grad school, speaks to my time at the Clay Studio. And I think um, I'm so excited to send this to Philadelphia because it is a great representation of what I learned there and this idea of working in these smaller components to build something that says more than an individual object will. Yeah, that's great. And I, I, I think that that speaks to what we were all talking about before, which is you have to figure out how to be an artist and how to make make it work. And one of the a practical thing is to make small objects and just to use them as um, to to build up to a greater whole because it it's more manageable, especially if you're sort of going off to work at the cafe or something in between. Um, it's also I hope there's a sense of understanding things like shipping um, from watching things coming in and out of the gallery and that the, the, the aspect of shipping a bunch of little stuff is easier than shipping one giant <laughs> sculpture um, and less expensive probably as well. Although not when the USPS isn't working correctly, right Joanna? Very true, that lesson it's, learned. <laughs> there's little guys somewhere in between Arkansas and Philadelphia, yeah. but it'll get here eventually. It'll get here at some point. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> and those clothing swaps, like you have probably still have things. Well, maybe I, I know people keep things from a long time and mm. they'll say like, oh, I got this from, you know, Dominique or whatever. So it's a nice way to have that memory tangible. Yeah, definitely. Excellent. Thank you. So let's go on to Chase. Would you like to talk about your piece in the show? Oh, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, a lot of my work uh, recently um, has to do with uh, this relationship between the earth and the moon. 
Um, and I actually, when I was at the Clay Studio in Philly, I used to talk to the moon. Um, my space was in the very back and I had, um, I called it my balcony because it, my space was right there. But um, I used to sit on the balcony and, um, and I would talk to the moon about my ex actually uh, most of the time. And um, so the piece that you're looking at is titled uh, Axes and it's two of infinity. And it's a series, it's an ongoing series that I, that I'm gonna, that I make um, for my um, exhibitions. I always have one or two in it. And so, um, but it's actually a cast pipe wrench. It's all newspaper. Um, and actually when I moved to Philly, uh, I was casting newspaper in ceramic at Boulder in grad school, but it wasn't until I got to Philly and actually I believe Joanna um, said this to me because our studios were close to each other, but um, well, and we hung out a lot, uh, but um, you said to me, why don't you just leave the paper paper? And I started doing that actually uh, at, and I think you might have a bowl that I made, a bowl with like an apple in it. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, but anyway, I love them so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, I made this bowl with an apple. I don't know, I don't even know why I made that. But, um, but this piece in particular um, is really thinking about trying to find one single point and uh, with an X, Y, and Z axis. Um, the X axis being the candles that are intertwined together. It's a photograph with um, this pie print hanging, which makes the uh, Y axis. And then the Z axis is this tiny little quilt pen that's pointed in the center. And I'm really interested in trying to create these points that are seemingly, uh, with objects that are seemingly um, disconnected. And um, for instance, like, you know, if, if we were to find ourselves on the moon, a candle would not have, could not have fire because there is no oxygen. We wouldn't have water, so a pipe wrench would be irrelevant. And then a quilt pen that's used to kind of hold things in place, there's no gravity. And so that, that this sculpture is actually made out of things that are so relevant to what it means to be human on earth um, and using those elements um, at play. Um, I really, um, I actually, I, I think that to try to find a point, a single point um, in space is futile. Um, and it's also kind of dumb. And I use that word, uh, I use that word um, lovingly um, because the earth is constantly, um, the earth and the universe are, um, are constantly expanding. So if you think about that, um, one point is kind of silly. Uh, and so I really like, I like making them. Also, if you went to art school, you always know you never put anything in the center. Um, and so I just like kind of breaking that rule and just, uh, and putting something in the center and, um, as kind of an exercise in, um, I don't know, uh, in like trying to be a scientist maybe, <laughs> but I'm not. Um, so anyway, um, and as far as newspaper goes, I really, I love, I used so much in Philly because I didn't have any money. So I, I newspaper was so readily available. Um, and um, I always say um, in my formal, uh, artist statements, um, newspaper tells the stories of our lives. And, um, and when I think about ceramic, uh, ceramic tells the civilizations that came before us and the, and the migration of people, but it does, it's, it's more personal. And I think that newspaper to me is just so much more potent for this work, which is why I used it, um, if that makes sense. Yeah. I, I'm interested in that if you went to art school, you know not to put anything in the center because I didn't go to art school. They don't teach you that in art history school. <laughs> <laughs> you think the triangle? I don't know. Um, yeah, the idea that it, you, you talk about being a scientist, but, but also like the, the math concept of a point. Um, <clears throat> so as you, when we were talking about this the other day when you came in, I just, it it's true. It, there is no there is no point, you can't do that. Um, is that. Does our whole civilization just start to unravel 
when you <laughs> there's no way to find one point in space i don't know um in the face of everything else that's unraveling it's, it's kind of nice to think about something uh a little bit beyond a lot beyond my uh intellect for sure but you gotta stretch to try to get there thank you for making my brain stretch i appreciate that um great thanks chase how about you paulina do you want to go next Yeah, sure. Um, yes, so um, my practice uh, keeps constantly changing a lot. So it was really hard for me to do anything that I was doing back then or kind of even refer to that. But um, what can I say is that prior to coming to Philadelphia, I was working a lot with uh, like my sculpture were like raw clay and I was using ceramic as a component for like sculptures. So uh, I guess I got really excited seeing everybody working and so and I guess maybe the pottery also having have to do with something with such a strong presence. So I got really into like hand building and and really making like very, very ceramic work. And um, yeah, so currently I've been working a lot of like I've been exploring the intersection between two dimensional and three dimensional expression. So um, this uh, tree, I guess you can call it trip triptych. I don't know what that's in English, but yeah, um, no, it's the same. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so this work is titled The Lucky Hand. It's, uh, it's a little bit uh, tongue in cheek. Uh, it's kind of referring to um, fortune telling, but also gambling at the same time. And um, yeah. Um, and I was also, um, I, get, I guess I, this is, so this is uh, Parian clay. You're familiar with that? Like, sort of, um, I think I think it was uh, uh, 19th century Staffordshire, or I don't know where they invented it, but somewhere in UK just to uh, imitate kind of marble and it has this kind of nice color. So the the mass of the work is uh, dyed, dyed through. Mm -hmm. And uh, so for me, this is kind of attempt to uh, play around with this idea of, um, a painting, like a very um, material approach to painting. And um, yeah. Um, to, to me, it has this um, strong reference to, well, a bunch of things, but including like an impressionist painting. I feel like there's a lot of people sitting around playing cards. Um, so it's like, I don't I was wondering if it had something to do with with your memory of being here, but it's interesting to hear about just like this idea of the the hands working. And I want everyone also to know that this piece particularly has been ready for the show for an entire year. So it, Paulina hasn't seen this since last January, probably because we were supposed to do this show at Ansika in Richmond. Um, and Paulina was one of the very few people who sent me her work on time. So it's been sitting in <laughs> in storage here um does it does it have that quality you think about impressionist painting you were talking about paintings so it has that kind no, of specific. i'm not i'm not thinking like specific uh style of painting no i'm i i guess i'm approaching it from like you know 2020 perspective um but i also want it to be a little bit dumb and um i, I think it's also like a kind of um like um scattered um, approach to a one thing, like uh, the lucky hand, it's cards, it's this uh, hand, like hand literally, it's a, it's a li little bit <laughs> dumb, <laughs> but I, well, I, play I just words. wanted to have a little bit fun, so uh, yeah. Fun is good, we like fun. Yeah. And yeah, and it's a play on words, it's a play on many meanings and um, I guess that we're we're working towards dumb as being the theme of our conversation today. But um, thank you, Paulina. I appreciate that. Matt, are you going to continue? I don't know if you're going to continue the dumb theme or not. 
it works on so many levels. It does. Um, it's one of my <laughs> nine-year-old's favorite words. Yeah, right, right. Well, the, um, the I was thinking about the clay studio in terms of what you had talked about as being like the impetus or how you might talk about it in relationship to your work. And of the group here today, um, you know, I was one of the people that was here, you know, quite some time ago or at the clay studio quite some time ago. And um, the, the one continuing thread that I continue to see in my own work is how I, when I moved to Philadelphia out of graduate school, I was already invested in making work that I felt one of the appealing things to me about it was work that had to that tried to um, use a surface that was kind of gritty and kind of um, a, a type of surface that I felt revealed what was the the, the gritty underbelly to things and interested in in things like well this so much of our our surfaces have these veneers of of smoothness or delicateness and i wanted to make things that you know scrape away that surface and reveal that that grittier kind of substrate beneath the surface in philadelphia and the in and to an extent uh, the, the clay studio was such a great place to develop that palette or to continue to work on that palette. And it's a continuing thread to this day, you know, 20, 20 some years later, is that um, I really responded to the urban architecture of Philadelphia. I really responded to the, the grittiness of it. Uh, Ruth and Rick commented about the old city environment and how vibrant the galleries made that and it was it was all of those things in combination um that really resonated with me and i would go to the delaware river the coast guard at the time uh would allow me onto the coast guard pier and i would take photographs of the the buoys and things that they would put out on the delaware river and all of the the, the scratched red paint with the rust showing through on the buoys. Um, there was just so much about Philadelphia in general and Old City specifically that I really um, responded to in terms of surfaces and all of those veneers and the peeling paint and the brickwork and the history and the layers of the history revealed through the surfaces. And that's been something that's been a continuing thread throughout my my working life has been those types of uh, grab you know uh, gravitating towards those types of surfaces. So that's something that continues. And the Clay Studio was a big part of, uh, or Old City Philadelphia was such a great way to uh, inform some of those sensibilities that I that I was uh, that I had at the time, and. Um, and in this piece in general, uh, the uh, I continue to make objects uh, that I feel like try to make some sort of reference or commentary on the human condition. This piece is called the Lord's Prayer Wheel. Um, it, it prayer wheel with the Lord's parenthetically in front of it, the, the Lord's Prayer Wheel. And uh, I was given a necklace one uh, years and years ago that had a Sanskrit prayer in it. And I asked the, this, it was this, this monk who had given it to me, this Buddhist monk. And I asked him what the prayer said on the paper inside this rice paper. And it said, he said, the prayer says, God pray for me. And um, I always wanted to make something that related to that idea of, I'm not, um, I, I just thought it was such a beautiful idea that some greater, power was was praying for us rather than us uh praying to this this greater greater power and that always just really stood out to me that little prayer written on a piece of rice paper and so i wanted to make um the idea of 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 god praying for us and mm. so this would be the this would be the, uh, conceivably the prayer wheel that that god would spin for us that's yeah that was as soon as you said that god pray for me like god doesn't need to pray because <laughs> that's that's the idea but you, it, it's an it's a nice um cycle to think of it in that yeah. way um the yeah. word that i was thinking of as you were talking was patina mm, um right. and that all the the surfaces um 
in our neighborhood and, and of the building of the clay studio are so integral to what the place is, kind of how different parts go together, um, two separate buildings that were joined and, um, you know, all of those things are looping back around maybe to, to my comment when Paulina was talking about leaving a place in order to really appreciate it. Um, as we think about leaving the building, mm. we can, it, it may be sad, but it's also a chance to really sit down and appreciate what's valuable about that space and how it um, cultivated the community that we are today and how we can take the best of that with us as we move on and maybe improve on it. Um, but not to forget that there's something about that grittiness and the patina of age mm -hmm. and the, the different, the differences coming together. That was, um, I think what has made us strong and will continue to. And every time I talk about that, I can't help but say, make sure everybody knows how hard Jennifer Martin has worked to um, plan the new building in a way that does take into account the great things that we have in our current space and to, to improve upon them and to take away the barriers that we've experienced because of some of the, the patina, the, the bad aspects of the, the way things have come together. So um, recording the, the current building and really um, appreciating it and then moving forward is really, I think, important. Um, so yeah, there's been a lot of hard work. So hopefully when we all walk into the new building, we'll feel some of the, the wonderful comfort of the old space and, and all those new things too. I think that uh, I'm definitely going to take a slice of the gallery wall so that you can see the 100 layers of paint that are that I have to spackle every time I put a new exhibition up. I'm going to frame a little piece of that because it's, it's had a big impact on my time. I really appreciate everybody's um, thoughtfulness and the, the work that you've all sent to, uh oh, what did I do? Um, so that people can share it in the gallery space. Um, we have, uh, as I said before, 50 works of art by different artists over the last couple of three decades worth of residence. Um, and we have certainly more residents who can be highlighted um, from the past who we will just keep having shows like this. Um, on Saturday, all of these works will be available on the website so you can check them out and we are open for anyone who's in Philadelphia Friday, Saturday and Sundays from 11 to 6 or 12 to 6 on Sundays. Um, Next week, we have Don Nakamura, who also was a resident artist um, only for about six months, but he was a Franklin Mint Fellow, I think in 1987. And he has a show, a solo show in the Bonovitz Gallery. So that's also going to be open on Saturday, and he will be our guest for Lunch and Learn next week. And then we'll have another celebration for this exhibition with some more artists uh, in early February. So does anyone on any of our guests have parting thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Give you all a chance. Just wanted to say, as always, thank you to the Clay Studio, all of you uh, folks, Jay-Z and uh, Jennifer Martin, Amy from uh, the past Clay Studio administration represent and, uh, and Ruth from Old City, just some of the familiar faces here. Uh, uh, appreciate all of the things that have gone into building that place. Um, it has a place in my heart and in my memory that is very, uh, it just, it's just very significant, even from going back to when I was an undergraduate student in college, uh, just had a very prominent place in my psyche as an artist. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Matt. That's so nice. Appreciate it a lot. Anybody else? I just hope that somebody will be writing about Old City and those times when there were all those galleries and all that energy. Uh, we did have an interview with someone, but I don't know whether he ever got it finished. It was supposed to come out this month from Temple University, but it was a very special time in our city. And, uh, 
Well, we're going to be celebrating 50 years of the Clay Studio in 2024. And we've already started thinking about that and getting ready. And then, um, you know, it occurred to me thinking about that, that 2026 is the 50th anniversary of the Bicentennial, which in Philadelphia was a very big deal and really was a huge injection into the cultural and historic um, fabric of the city, which I think also needs to be acknowledged. So to me, there's a definitely a citywide exhibition about the Philadelphia craft renaissance of the 70s that is coming somehow, some way. <laughs> Anyone want to help us write that grant? You let me know. We are having a 50th reunion of the South Street Renaissance in the fall. Oh, great. October, and all the old photographs are being assembled. So oh, that's exciting. We're we'll over there in our wheelchairs. <laughs> <laughs> well, some Whatever. Of I think Rick could probably beat me in a, in a running race. I'm not worried about you. <laughs> oh, no. I'm looking at John Souter's new work at the moment. Yeah, oh. John, John Sanders. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Be that, uh, work exchange, maybe. It would be in that Objects 2020 show that is a representation of the mm -hmm. uh, Objects USA from yeah. 1969. Looks great. That's the, so uh, many uh, anniversaries. Yeah. yeah, everyone should check out that show. That sounds exciting. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, we really you appreciate everyone. your time. Thank you. Hi, Jen Martin. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Jace. Thanks, Joanna. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.